In my last video, I talked about what the Axis could do to win World War II and bring about their victory. Now, we will look at what that victory means for the world. The timeline will start in 1950, as the Germans start to push past the Urals and fortify their positions, and India is given independence. To keep some level of organization, I'll be going continent by continent, discussing the impact of the war and how the countries deal with the new order. We start in the West, where America is still the dominant power and has never moved out of their isolationism. Seeing the sorry state of the rest of the world, they certainly wouldn't change that opinion. But American political leaders wouldn't have any choice but to be proactive in foreign policy to check any German or Japanese expansion into the Americas. The US would do what it always does. Invite Central and South American governments to join a mutual defense pact and replace anyone who refuses to join with a more friendly regime. Culturally, America takes a very different turn, and we'll start with the civil rights movement. Without our fight against the Nazis and the horrors of the Holocaust to wake up the American public to the negative impacts of racism, I'm not sure the movement would get off the ground. But Martin Luther King and Malcolm X already existed at this point, and it's possible that the movement would still make an impact, but it's hard to say. America in our timeline was very anti-Nazi for obvious reasons, and keeping up institutions like segregation didn't match the idealism of a free America saving the world from racist totalitarianism. In this timeline, that sentiment doesn't exist. People were indifferent to Hitler at best, and many even admired him for saving Germany. So it's doubtful that racist policies in the US would be removed or rolled back at all, given how half-hearted it was done in our own timeline. I don't know if the free love hippie movement would even happen in this timeline, as that depends on the social blowback from the up-and-coming generation. Speaking of boomers, in our timeline, boomers grew up in the single greatest economic period of American history. America became grossly wealthy after World War II, because they were the only country that hadn't been destroyed by the war and had all their infrastructure and industry intact, so they were able to make a profit rebuilding the war-torn world. In this timeline, America never gets that opportunity, so the economic boom of the 50s never happens. This has several ramifications. First, cars never gained the popularity they had in our timeline. American businessmen wouldn't have the capital necessary to invest in building cars, and the government wouldn't have the money to build highways, at least not at the rate that they were building them in our timeline. Second, things like TVs, fridges, and microwaves take longer to develop, as businessmen wouldn't have the resources to invest in these inventions for some time. This removes the whole basis for American society as we know it. Boomers would never have this starry-eyed idealism of working hard, going to college, and getting a career, then retiring with enough money to be comfortable. There's just not enough money for this to be popular or realistic dream, which brings all of FDR's socialist reforms into question early on. Looking at other countries in this area, it's known that Argentina had strong German sympathies, but I doubt it would risk its own survival at the hands of America just to be buddies with Hitler. In our timeline, Argentina stayed neutral primarily because it wanted to keep good relations with the Axis and didn't break ties with them until 1944. In this timeline, they wouldn't openly declare for the Axis, but they certainly wouldn't break ties with them. I'm not sure what this would accomplish in the long run, but it does mean Argentina would keep the door open to the possibility of being good friends with the Axis going forward. I'm not sure if the Cuban Revolution would happen, but even if it does, without a backer like the USSR, they'd never make it anywhere, and Germany would give the US a letter of thanks for their fight against communist insurgents. Ultimately, in a sea of totalitarian militarism, the Americans are an island of freedom, which is pretty ironic given that most of these countries would be repressive dictatorships and America itself would still be very oppressive to its black citizens. Next, we move on to Africa. In this timeline, colonialism endures. The US props up British colonies around the globe, while Germany does the same for France. There would certainly be rebel movements throughout the continent, but I doubt they'd get that far, given that the Nazis would happily send men to put down these rebellions as part of their military and ideological training. Britain's colonies might end up being autonomous, and perhaps even self-governing in time, depending on the direction the British government ends up taking, but this is a big maybe. In our timeline, South Africa elected the Nationalist Party in 1948, which enforced apartheid in the country. There's little doubt in my mind that this would happen again. However, in this timeline, Britain doesn't put sanctions on South Africa for fear of them joining the Nazis. But the British public would be horrified, so culturally, South Africa would move away from Britain and closer to Germany, who would have no criticisms for the racist policies of the country. It's possible Germany might demand its old colonies back as a source of pride, but I doubt this would actually happen, given that they'd have to deal with all of Europe. Africa is a more stable place than in our timeline, but only because European power are being funded to keep their colonies together. The place probably becomes more oppressive, but it might also, in the British colonies at least, provide more opportunities for education and jobs within the colonies and around the empire. And now we come to Europe. 
where do I even start? In this timeline, Britain is removed from events on the continent. They keep strong economic and cultural ties to the US and basically sever themselves from the continent. While they might be part of it geographically, they certainly are part of North America culturally. By 1955, Hitler is dead for no particular reason, but he'd be 66 by now, and his health was declining during the war, so I see no reason for him to live an extended lifespan. He lives long enough to watch Germany slug it out with the USSR, who, due to their failure of leadership, is slowly being pushed back over the course of 14 years. With his death comes the problem of succession. Goering was Hitler's designated successor, but I doubt Himmler would simply let that happen, given that he's the commander of the SS. But in the end, I think Goering would come out on top. I'm really pushing for Goering here, despite his morphine addiction, because I'm trying to get the Reich to survive, and that's just not possible with Himmler in charge. The turn Nazi Germany would take under Himmler would cause widespread rebellion across the continent while it's already in a very fragile state, and Germany would be hard-pressed to deal with a population half-hearted in their support and rebel movements tearing at every corner of their domain. No, I don't want it to sound like I'm just handing it to Goering. He's got a good base for becoming the leader. First, he's the designated successor. Second, he's in charge of Prussia and the Air Force. And third, he's the moderate candidate, compared to someone like Himmler. What that means is that he'd most likely have the support of the military, since the military wasn't overly fond of the SS. It's possible that Himmler could have Goering assassinated or that Goering dies of an overdose, but I doubt this puts Himmler in charge. At that point, the military might put someone like Rommel or Goebbels in charge, but even so, that changes little when compared to the radical Himmler. For the sake of ease, we'll say that Goering lives long enough to gain control of the government and Nazi Germany becomes slightly less radical. Only slightly. And as we'll see, that won't mean much. The Jews and Gypsies are removed from Europe by the mid-1960s, through mass deportations, experimentation, and extermination in death camps. Though the Nazis continue to treat them as a sort of boogeyman to scare the people into obedience. Eventually, being a Jew or a Gypsy in Europe has no actual meaning. It just becomes a term for anyone you don't like. You label them a threat or a burden to the community. And that's what matters most in Nazi Germany, the ethnic community. The Nazis had a large number of programs to encourage community and solidarity amongst the Germans, such as the Hitler Youth and the Strike Through Joy program. These would likely be expanded over time, while institutions like marriage and orphanages would be under great supervision and control of the state, as the future of children and their ethnic and ideological solidarity with other Germans would be of paramount importance. Having children with non-Germans would be considered a disgrace, and having a child with a Slav would be a crime. Heritage would be a big deal in this timeline. Criminal activity would land you in a camp, and if you're a routine offender, you won't be leaving, as the Nazis have no tolerance for so-called habitual criminals. In this timeline, psychology doesn't become a respectable field of science, as it was dismissed as a Jewish invention. Any mental illnesses are dismissed as hereditary diseases that lower your value to the community. Things like drug addiction or kleptomania would just be seen as a personal problem that can only be solved by sending you to a concentration camp. Camps are also the spot for anyone the higher-ups don't like, and denunciations of your enemies as Jewish or homosexual would likely be common practice throughout the Reich. Like modern-day communist China, people would need ties to the Nazi party to secure better paying jobs and avoid legal trouble, and a system of social credit to set your value to the community would be put into place. Everyone the Nazi higher-ups dislike, for basically any reason, will be shot or sent east to work in camps on the other side of the Urals. The Czechs and Poles would be moved out of their homes in East Central Europe and deported for slave labor and extermination further east. This process would continue probably well into the 70s, as this would be a major goal for the Nazi government. Their lands would be settled by Germans and incorporated into the Reich fully, which would be cause for mass celebrations across the Reich. Gains like this would be used to distract the populace from underlying political and economic issues. Moving east would give the chance for a new start for people decades to come, and not just for Germans. The Germans would be happy to move Norwegians, Danes, Swedes, Dutch, Belgian, French, and even English settlers to the east to populate the area. And with each new wave of immigrants comes another wave of exterminations, as the Ukrainians, Belarusians, Baltic peoples, and Russians are killed off to make room. This eastern movement would take a lot of manpower, as the Russians are not going to lay down and die. Insurrections and acts of sabotage will be normal for several decades as the native Russians actively work against the genocidal oppressors. Science and medical studies would go in a horrifying direction. As mentioned earlier, genealogy would be especially important and possibly mandatory in Nazi Germany to prove your value to the community and show that you don't contain any heritage the Nazis would deem dangerous. Racism would be considered a fact and all future academic considerations would be built around that. Anyone trying to prove that race as a scientific fact is wrong would be undermining the national community and be removed from their practice. 
Nazi science would be highly dependent on experimentation and unwilling people, and this would only become more widespread in the medical field as Slavs and Africans are dehumanized in the eyes of the Nazis. Breeding of people would be considered a respectable profession, and the Nazis would release pamphlets encouraging people to be aware of any hereditary diseases that need to be removed from the community, and any Jewish or Slavic ancestry, or mental issues like autism that would make you a burden to the nation. I imagine it will be a regular occurrence for a German mother to hide her autistic child from the government until she can move to another country where this is more acceptable. In this world, women would be restricted to a handful of jobs like nursing and teaching, while slave labor would substitute for the lack of men in Germany, as any available men would be off in the east fighting Russians. The Germans would keep their economy artificially stable by managing international trade and their workforce, sending people across their vast empire to a place where they could get a better job or serve in the military rather than stay home and be poor. Most every Every male would be in the military, service would eventually become mandatory, and anyone who openly disapproved of the military would be considered a coward and a traitor. The military would also be one of the best ways to advance your career, since in the Reich you were guaranteed a government job after your military term was up, which would probably lead to a bloated government after only a few generations. And no one would be able to speak up about it because, you know, it's Nazi Germany. On the international scene, the 50s, 60s, and 70s are plagued by rebellions across the continent. Germany would annex Sweden eventually and split Switzerland with Italy. The Serbs would be exterminated and their land split between Germany's allies allies who would live in fear of the German and Italian military power. They'd be forced to go along with whatever trade deals and public works programs the Nazis and Italians would want to improve their control of the nations. Hungary, Croatia, Bulgaria, and Romania would have to allow German businesses into their country to build and develop as they pleased, while Germany and Italy would mitigate the influence of foreign businesses on their nations. The Axis countries would not be allowed to trade with Britain or the US, and they'd have to allow Germany and Italy to interfere with their internal workings as well. I can see Germany and Italy moving into countries to crush local uprisings, while installing a friendly government again and annexing bits of territory. These nations would be subordinate to Germany and Italy, and any attempt to move out of their orbit would be met with violence. A big question is if Italy will be subject to Germany, if they will find a balance, or if they will try to gain control. Two out of three of these get rid of Italy as a major power. Italy cannot compete with Germany militarily or economically, and any confrontation between them will result in the loss of the Tyrol and Italy becoming a puppet state. They wouldn't be completely disassembled, as Germany would want them to keep their empire intact so they didn't have to deal with it. Unless Italy has a few shrewd political leaders in a row, I don't think the proud Italians wouldn't antagonize the Germans and try to be more independent. This would result in an Italian puppet state, I imagine, around the 1960s. In time, probably close to our present, Germany might harbor dreams of restoring the old Holy Roman Empire borders by taking more lands from France and Italy. But this is a maybe. Over the decades, Germany will annex Sweden, Norway, Holland, Belgium, Denmark, and parts of France, though the proud French will never surrender themselves to the Germans, and rebel movements will spark up time and again. To synopsize an overly complex situation, Europe never becomes stable. Germany is so busy trying to put down a multitude of rebellions, it's possible that these will tear the empire apart, but for the sake of the timeline, we'll say this doesn't happen, though a successful 1970s uprising against the Nazis would make a cool video in the future. Germany might set up a sort of European Union where everybody is beholden to Germany, but I can't be sure where their leadership will take them in time. In a future video, I might explore the idea of what the world would look like in the present, but for now I'll just leave this as is. After dealing with the oppressive mess that is Europe, we now move to Central Asia and the Middle East, which are messes in their own right. Central Asia is broken into the Soviet successor states, which all rail against the Nazis or join with them as suits them. This area is constantly at war because the Nazis will never back out and the Russians will never give in. But here, the Nazis are stretched thin and unwilling to move further. The Russians and Nazis fight for the area around the Urals fiercely, but with the Nazis so busy in Europe, they only have so many units to spare, while the Russians would be desperately trying to push the invaders back as far as possible. The Islamic world would be doing okay. Iraq would probably deal with some of the same issues they dealt with in our timeline, while Iran would try and dominate the Middle East. The Saudis would try and play the Americans and Germans off each other, but given how close Germany is and their aggressive reputation, the Saudis would be forced to trade primarily with Italy and Germany. Honestly, given the ties Germany and Italy would have with Iraq and Iran, the Saudis probably would never gain the wealth they have had in our timeline. Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine would be French and Italian colonies, and would most likely remain that way for some time. Turkey would be in a rough spot and might face hostility from their neighbors, but the Germans were relatively friendly with the Turks, so I imagine they get along fine in this timeline. Iraq, Iran, and Turkey would vie for control of the area, and Germany and Italy would watch and encourage their rivalries. 
In South Asia, Britain divides India like in our timeline, and they become a nominal British ally to prevent the Japanese encroachment. They become a highly nationalist and militant country, forced to stand its ground on a hostile Asia. Pakistan would be a rival to Iran and India, and it's possible they might get partitioned between the two, but I'm not sure. Pakistan might look to Japan for support against the Indians and Iranians, but this is difficult to say. Nepal and Bhutan would survive just because no one would want to invade them. In East Asia, we have more slavery and genocide. Japan would be forced to make a series of puppet states across all of Asia to make the continent manageable, while annexing the Chinese coastal areas and resource-rich rural areas like Borneo and New Guinea. China being broken up would not sit well with the Chinese, who would dream of reuniting their country. Many would be forced west to the interior or killed to make room for Japanese settlers along the coast. The areas around Shanghai and Hong Kong would be annexed by Japan and filled with Japanese settlers. Normally, when China is invaded and occupied, the invader would make their home in China and become absorbed into Chinese culture. But Japan will be keeping their homeland instead of just moving in. It also must be understood that Japan has been imitating China for centuries, and this war is, in part, to steal China's cultural supremacy in Asia. Japan would be trying to destroy the very culture much of their way of life is derived from, which would be a bit paradoxical. Japan would probably end up leaving the Chinese puppet states intact the further west you go, and this would cause serious issues for them going forward. As they force more people west to clear space for their empire along the coast, the western areas fill with disgruntled Chinese who want revenge. With control of the coast and superior resources, and over time, maybe even superior manpower, the Japanese would use these wars against the Chinese as an excuse to butcher more and more of their people. Perhaps in a century or so, the Japanese would move their capital onto the mainland, but keeping the purity of their culture would be considered paramount to the Japanese. In our timeline, China uses its business interest in other countries to export their population and control the economy of that area. Japan would do the same thing, but more directly. Their control of Asia would largely hinge on their population continuing to expand, and it very well might. But if that doesn't happen, Japan will be faced with rebellions it won't be able to put down. In time, I think their puppet states would have less interference politically, while Japan would tighten its economic and military grip on the continent. The Japanese Navy and carrier-based Air Force would become the greatest in the world, as they would use it to intimidate their puppet states and colonies across the Pacific. The former Russian area would be relatively easy to control, and by that I mean the Japanese would have very limited interests there. The Soviet Far East is resource-rich, but that's about it. So Japan would let those states do as they please, so long as their business interests remain unthreatened. I can see them putting military bases along the coast and next to any major industrial areas throughout the Pacific. Relations between Japan and the U.S. remain intense, and that never goes away. It's not impossible for them to go to war one day, but we can talk about that another time. Australia and New Zealand would keep close ties to America, just because they'd have no other choice. America would be the only thing keeping the Japanese at bay, so they'd naturally allow the U.S. to set up naval and air bases in their country and keep good relations. They'd work out a demarcation line of control of the Pacific, using any instance of the Japanese Navy passing out of their area of control as an excuse for reprisals, but the Japanese would stay within their bounds so as not to piss off America. I'm sure some of you are wondering about the atomic bombs. America dumped considerable resources into a bomb because they were at war. But without that war to push them along, they don't dedicate as much to making a bomb. So it probably takes another 5 to 10 years to develop. Germany was already working on a bomb, but they didn't have the resources to spare and wouldn't until the war was basically over. Let's say they put considerable resources into it after the capture of Moscow. That would probably still be after 1945, as I imagine holding the city for extended periods of time would become its own issue. So the Germans and Americans get the bomb around the same time, but it's the Germans that use it first. They drop it in Russia, probably on a major city a bit east of Moscow, like Gorky. This area would become a site of pride for the Germans to show their technological superiority and dedication to victory. The Japanese wouldn't develop nukes for some time, as the Emperor thought it would vaporize the atmosphere. But in time, I imagine they'd look into it, perhaps after the Germans used theirs. This timeline is bleak, full of death, and waiting to fall apart. I've presented a sort of best case scenario for the Axis that's still grounded in a level of realism, but honestly, their empires are ready to come apart at the seams. There will be no Thousand Year Reich because building an empire off of that much hate, discrimination, and terror makes everyone resentful and determined to get rid of it. If you threaten every Russian and Chinese person with extinction, they will fight to the death because death is the only option they're being given. And if I'm going to die, I might as well die fighting for my freedom. Before we end here, I just want to thank everyone who came to my channel on the 21st of April. I went from 6 to 1.4 thousand subscribers in a single day, and I really appreciate the support from all of you. I have some things in the works, but this is a new channel, so I'll be checking in with you guys to see what kind of content you'll be interested in going forward.